Hello, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Creatives Chat. I'm Rusty. I'm Peter. And Peter, tell everyone who we have on our show today. Oh, Rusty, we have a treat for you today. So we have an acclaimed professor of bioengineering from the University of Washington. His academic accolades and accomplishments cover a diverse scope of studies, fields, and professional communities. The list is so vast, so be sure to check out the description below. He's written and published numerous top-selling award-winning books, one of the world's leading researchers in the realm of water, the scientific revolutionary himself, Dr. Gerald Pollack. Everybody, let's meet Dr. Pollack as we chat about who knows what. Streaming from Retro Earth Studio and brought to you by WeAreHistorically.com Conscious Human Apparel and Learn to play jazz piano like a pro by a pro with Jazz Piano Pro Essentials at JazzPianoPro.com Everybody, meet Dr. Pollock. I just want to say thank you so much for coming on Creatives Chat. I've been so excited for this interview. <laughs> uh, well, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, so in terms of the start, what inspired you to really start to study and trans and transition from more like the, the cardiovascular muscular research into water itself and making it your main focus? Uh, well, uh, there are two things. First, uh, there is an innate sense of curiosity. Um, and uh, what, what could be, <coughs> excuse me, what could be more central to nature and especially to life than water. Uh, yeah. that, that's the kind of general theme, but more specifically, um, more specifically, it was about uh, 25 years ago, roughly, um, that um, a Hungarian scientist uh, was coming to my laboratory, and I, a ra rather senior guy, and I picked him up at the airport with his wife, and uh, was driving him from SeaTac Airport to I think it was to my home where we were gonna put them up for until they could find a place to live. And Charles said to me, he said, you know, Jerry, um, this was the first time I met the guy. He said, you should go to Hungary. Well, why should I go to Hungary? He said, because in Hungary, there's a very important meeting and, uh, and the meeting, it's a conference, a scientific conference <laughs> to celebrate uh, the, the work of uh, the late, uh, uh, a late uh, biophysicist who, who was rather distinguished. And there were two areas of interest. One is muscle contraction, and the second is water. So I thought, or he thought, uh, Charles said, you should go there and represent muscle because the thinking of this biophysicist was not so different from your thinking about muscle, w which differed from the mainstream. But there are people around the world who, um, who were thinking similarly, and that was one. And, so I thought, well, hey, that sounds pretty interesting. Why not? The second area was, was water. And of course, I knew nothing about water except what I drink. Uh, and I went there, and, and there I met um, a guy named Gilbert Ling, L-I-N-G, uh, who had a profound uh, 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 influence on, on my scientific life and other aspects of my life, too. And, and I had known about Gilbert Ling since my graduate student days because he, uh, he lived in Philadelphia and I was a student at the University of Pennsylvania. And one day, uh, one day there was a dinner of some sort and I happened to um, land an invitation to go to the dinner as did a colleague of mine. And we're sitting and eating the main course and he leans over to me and says, see that, that Chinese guy a few tables away? He's that weird guy who thinks that the water inside the cell is not like liquid water. Uh, it, it's different. The molecules are actually lined up um, with one another, like soldiers standing at attention inside of cells. And he's a crackpot. Okay. So, so he pointed him out to me. And I, so from that point on, you know, you don't, you don't ordinarily get uh, introduced in that way to someone uh, someone who's called a crackpot. And many people would consider Gilbert Ling a crackpot. 
However, Gilbert Lane was selected to come to this country um, as, as one of three special people. It was the first cohort of Chinese scientists after World War II to come and study in this country. So they searched throughout China and they picked three guys. One was a physicist who went on to win a Nobel Prize. Uh, another one was a chemist. And the third was the biologist, that was Gilbert Ling. And they all thought Gilbert Ling was the smartest, perhaps among, among the three of them. And so Gilbert spent a good portion of his life challenging dogma and mm. especially challenging the idea that the water that's inside your cell, my cells, that the water is liquid water. He said, well, it's not exactly liquid water. The molecules are stacked. It's like um, they were lined up, and, and, uh, as I mentioned. So I met Gilbert in Hungary, and I was really impressed. Um, I was impressed by what he presented. But more than that, I was impressed by the dozen or so other people who attended the meeting who had evidence to support Gilbert Ling's point of view. And Gilbert's point of view was not only theoretical, he spent a good portion of his life collecting evidence, uh, uh, indeed, that, that the water, in, that biological water, uh, was different from any, any ordinary uh, water. And I came away really impressed. I made friends with some of those people and I heard what they had to say. I heard positive comments about Gilbert Ling. I heard a few uh, ones that questioned, a few aspects, but basically the presentations by these people were so overwhelmingly uh, supportive that I came away thinking, uh, if this guy's right, uh, this is this is really important and much more important than muscle contraction. Uh, muscle contraction is of course important and occupied my attention for uh, uh, a couple of decades. We did a lot of work. I, I think some of our work was interesting work and our ideas differed from the mainstream ideas, but um, I think we didn't really have a whole lot of success in convincing many people because because the, uh, um, the, the, the person who, who led the mainstream view was a rather distinguished scientist. His name was Sir Andrew Huxley. And Huxley was a Nobel Prize winner uh, from the distinguished Huxley family. And many, many of the people in the field, you know, are faced with a decision to make, uh, to follow the mainstream view of Sir Andrew Huxley, Nobel laureate, who would walk into the room and there was a hush, you know, God has walked in. Yeah. Or following <laughs> some more, shall we say, non-mainstream views. Uh, and so I, I, I think I lost out to um, Sir Andrew uh, Huxley. And um, anyway, I, I, I was, uh, I did tend to be curious about the fact that in in understanding muscle contraction, nobody was taking into account water. Mm -hmm. and, and water, after all, um, two thirds of muscle is water, two thirds by volume. And if you were to line up all the molecules in, in, a, in the muscle and start counting them one by one, uh, you know the answer, more than 99 out of 100 are, are water molecules. Yeah. And, um, uh, People don't, don't really know that, or they get confused by uh, 99 out of 100 versus two thirds, but we're talking about the number of molecules. And it has to be that way because the water molecules are small. And to make up that two thirds mm -hmm. volume, you've got to stuff a lot of those molecules in. So, so yeah. a, a point that came to full realization is, how is it possible that, that uh, in, in, your, in your muscle cells or any cells in your body, 99 out of 100 molecules don't do anything. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like the, gen, the general consideration uh, is, is that basically the water molecules are, are the, the bath that bathes the more important molecules of life. It's like, you right. know, you, you jump into the bathtub and the water is there, it doesn't do anything, it just sits there. Right. And you do everything else, you wash yourself or whatever. And, and so, you know, it came to light that that's a kind of arrogant point of view to presume uh, yeah. that 99 out of 100 molecules don't do anything. 
And of course, Gilbert Ling by that time had come up with evidence. But one of the problems with Gilbert Ling, the late Gilbert Ling, he died just before his 100th birthday um, about a year ago, it, it, is that when Gilbert would sit down and write, he'd sit down at his typewriter or word processor and you know, he'd bat it out and that was it. And, and he'd publish it. And, and Gilbert, Gilbert had the sense that everybody in the world was maybe just as smart as he was and could pick up everything on first reading. Well, that was not the case at all. Um, uh, his, his books are really difficult to read. And by the time I met him, there were four or five books. By the time he passed, there were something like seven, oh, I wow. think. And, um, and I took it upon myself. I decided that this guy, if this guy is right, um, what I would like to do is to write a book uh, that described Gilbert's, Gilbert Ling's point of view in a way that was perhaps a bit more understandable. And, um, and I, I had some experience writing and I, I thought, well, I would take it upon myself to, to, uh, to do that. Uh, but before I did it, I checked with some of my students. I gave my students his book, one of his books, and then what do you think? And all of them came back to me and said, if this guy is right, and it looks like he's right because his evidence is overwhelming. Yeah. Um, if, if he's right, this is a revolution of the highest order in mm. not only biology, but even by, beyond the biology. Yeah. So I took it upon myself to start writing the book. And, and this was the 2001 book, not, not the latest book, The Fourth Phase of Water, okay. but 2001 book, uh, which was called Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life. It still is called by the same name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the idea, was, the idea was to present Gilbert Ling's um, uh, thoughts, ideas, in a way that was both understanding and palatable. Yeah. I'm not sure if I succeeded. Um, the, the, uh, the reviews of the, the book, unlike the newer book, where uh, the fourth phase of water, which has really gotten... Um, oh yeah, amazing reviews. I, <laughs> I'm sometimes astounded. Uh, if I feel depressed, wake up one day, I go to the reviews and read them, and I feel better <laughs> instantly. <laughs> it's kind of like that. But but uh, you know, they varied. Uh, they were polarized. Some of the reviews said, "Oh, this is just a rehash of Gilbert Ling," and everybody knows that Gilbert Ling is a crackpot, and um, you shouldn't pay any attention mm. to him. Therefore, pay no attention to this book. All the way to the other end, where a, a famous cell biologist from Harvard University, and of course, if it's from Harvard University, the guy must be right, uh, <laughs> who said, this is a 305-page preface to the future of cell biology. I like that one, of Ooh, course. That's yeah. powerful. Thought, well, he's got it right. <laughs> anyway, that, that was a long answer. I apologize to a short question. That's exactly, this is how we got interested. And of course, after that, yeah. uh, that book was published, um, I became interested in, in, in studying more about water. And that was that, that change that I made, that decision to shift from studying muscle contraction to, uh, to studying water was probably the best decision I ever made because we discovered so many really interesting things that I think um, way, way beyond Gilbert Ling and uh, oh, yeah. what, what he had been espousing, although the general theme uh, of Gilbert Ling, I think is absolutely correct, that the water yeah. inside the cell is a kind of what he calls structured water. But we learned so much more about it and we learned about yeah. more about the relevance of that water to life and beyond life. So I think I'll stop here because I suspect you're full of questions. <laughs> Oh, I mean, that's really the reason why I want to have you on Creative Chat is because there is so much potential information and knowledge that to me is really, it aligns more with ancient wisdom and these kind of, you know, the blending between spiritualism and the sciences where you're now able to actually quantify these amazing properties and truly show and demonstrate that there is a fourth phase of water that is so integral to this kind of 
I, I call the body really just like this water reactor, this bio oh, water reactor, this, this bio Beautiful. factory of Beautiful. just yeah. you know tying together the different elements of even just like ancient practices like qigong, tai chi, where you have this internal energy, and the whole point of it is based on capitalizing your own bioelectricity and really harnessing the the magnetic field that we have, the electrical field that we have. And it seems like this easy water demonstrates all these properties that if we were somehow able to kind of consciously work ourselves or actually like have that self knowing that ability again, that we could start to kind of bring out some of these metaphysical superhuman powers. Cause I mean, there's just so much that easy water has in terms of the property. So, I mean, for our audience that aren't knowledgeable on this, what would be your elevator pitch for easy water? How okay. The elevator it? pitch needs to be uh, less than one minute. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, if it's uh, doable. <laughs> take yeah. Your yeah. Elevator pitch. Um, when you say elevator pitch, uh, um, um, okay. Elevator pitch. Uh, there's a fourth phase of water. We all, we all learn that there's solid liquid and vapor. And since we're dealing with one to two minutes, I don't have to define those. Everybody knows. Yeah. We discovered a fourth phase. And this fourth phase uh, is similar to what Gilbert Ling and others have been uh, talking about, but it's somewhat different. Uh, we, found, we found that uh, this phase of water when grows, when water meets a particular kind of surface, a hydrophilic surface, the water undergoes a radical transformation. First, it's the, uh, the initial layer of water molecules that meet the surface. They undergo transformation from individual water molecules to a sheet-like honeycomb structure built of hexagons. And that sheet serves as a template for the buildup of the next sheet, which serves as the template for the buildup of the next sheet. And these sheets build and build and build, and they can build. We've seen examples with it where you can, these molecular sheets can build up to the a number of like on the order of a million of them. So this is no, no trivial uh, 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 laboratory curiosity. It's something, something really, really major. And um, so that, that's in general uh, how, how it builds. And the energy for a buildup, because you need energy to convert uh, randomly uh, oriented molecules that are bouncing around. If you want to create, transform that into something organized, um, it, it's like um, taking your, your messy room and straightening it. It takes energy to do that. It, it's the same sort of thing. Creating order means um, you have to put in energy. And we found that that energy is light. And um, that was a surprise for us, uh, and the kind of light is even more surprising because it's not visible light. Uh, you know, physicists consider light to be not only the very narrow spectral range of visible wavelengths, wavelengths that we can see, but infrared and, and, and beyond at the longer side, and ultraviolet and beyond at the shorter side. It's a light, can, they use the term light to describe all of those. So we found that it's not the visible light, but just beyond the visible in the infrared. Infrared is what mm. we usually refer to as heat. The two are not exactly the same, but almost the same. Yeah, yeah. So heat or infrared light, light is what it takes to build um, easy water. That's the second point. And the third point is that it's charged. Ordinary water is neutral. This water is charged. And typically has negative charge. And because this stuff fills your cells, it means that every cell in your body contains negative charge. Hmm. So, um, uh, so those are, that's the elevator pitch. There's a lot more, but um, you told me that I had two minutes. And so <laughs> I love it. Well, there we go. Um, we'll have, so just for our listeners, we have the link below. Um, it's going to be in the show description. Be sure to watch it. It's in which Dr. Pollock actually goes into a little bit more in depth of the research behind easy water. And it's a very digestible fashion. I think that's one of the reasons why you really have always kind of stuck out in the sense of the 
those researchers and scientists really exploring the concepts and potential of waters because you have a, a very eloquent way of breaking things down to the layman. And that's honestly why, you know, the fourth phase of water had so much success because it's, it's so digestible in terms of just everyday person. Like I have a background in biology and sciences. I work in a biophysics lab and big pharma. I understand a lot of things, but I already know a lot of concepts go over people's heads, but this concept of a crystalline structure in water. Um, and then what was, it? I think it was Williams who, um, he kind of led that there would probably be a fourth phase of water in his writings, like hundreds of years or hundred years ago about, um, but in terms of this crystalline structure, what was so unique about finding that and discovering that the first time? Well, it, it, it was, um, it was exciting to, uh, um, you know, to know that um, we've, we, we've got crystalline order inside our bodies and, and various people had been hinting that or even providing evidence. Mei Wan Ho, the late Mei Wan Ho was one of those, a, a gifted researcher I, and yeah. artist, by the way, <laughs> also from, originally from Hong Kong, um, who, who demonstrated that uh, beautifully in, in a, a rather primitive creature that various regions of this worm um, that each region had a specific crystalline order that you could see in, in, in the microscope is beautiful. Wow. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I, I guess um, it was, it's a really good question you asked. Um, uh, I hadn't really uh, thought deeply about it, but there were, there were many revelations that came not, not just, just once, but, but, but came sort of, one after another, and and when you put all of these uh, insights and revelations together, um, it it just became so exciting, and remains so exciting because uh, uh, we're talking about water, and we're talking about bodily function, but not just bodily function. This water exists everywhere uh, yeah. out, outside the body too. There's nothing, uh, shall we say, maybe nothing sacred about the body. Uh, well, perhaps there is something sacred about it. But I share, I must say that one of the things that came through light is a sharing of the kind of ancient wisdom that, that you're, you're talking about, um, particularly, particularly the idea of um, subtle energies that uh, can be transmitted, for example, from one person to, to another. Uh, you know, you come into a, to a room with somebody, um, and you kind of feel something. You, you don't mm -hmm. understand exactly where it's coming from. It's not something that the person said or showed or whatever, but there's a kind of energy that you, you feel. And, and also in the ancient uh, uh, wisdom, uh, there's a healing, uh, healing uh, by local healers uh, and, and also uh, uh, healing by distance healers uh, yeah. uh, through prayer and through uh, groups uh, who are doing the healing. And, you know, I must tell you that I myself have, have been subscribing to that. Um, I wrenched my back a few months ago, and I've been working with a, a Chinese healer um, and his associate. Uh, he's living in Toronto and the associate in Vancouver. And my back is better. Uh, I, of course, I, wow. I, can't, I can't conclude that, uh, that it isn't just time that's doing it or uh, whatever, but... but um, they have been working with me initially pretty much every day of the week um, and going through the, the healing. And other people have studied this and written, written about it. Uh, um, there's a book um, uh, called The Power of Eight. I'm not sure if you're hmm. aware of that, uh, by uh, Lynn um, McTaggart, Lynn McTaggart okay. who's written about subtle energies and such. And, uh, and she tried to, uh, to determine, uh, it, it was clear from, from the outset, uh, she's a you know, kind of science journalist, and it was clear at the outset that um, a group healing actually, actually works, but she was curious, how small can the group be? And, and still have the healing work. And so she did experiments mm -hmm. and she progressively reduced the size of the group down to eight. And she said eight seems to be the minimal number that works. And, 
and the book has has had quite a quite a, an impact um, uh, in terms of, of healing. So there is the, there is the idea about group healing, and and many of the people who are involved with that think that that it lies in water, and that's why I'm mm. I, I'm bringing this up. The idea is that the information that can be transmitted both both for for healing and also just in terms of um, feeling or uh, the, the subtle information or energy that's coming is somehow embedded in the water. And <laughs> yeah. at first, you know, years ago, I, I don't, I don't mean um, millennia. Um, I mean, 30 years ago when a uh, famous scientist uh, named Jacques Benveniste, whose name you might know, but I, uh, I'm not sure if your listeners know, uh, he was a French scientist, a uh, rather famous one whose findings appear in standard microbiology uh, textbooks. Someone came to his laboratory, um, he was doing some experiments uh, and uh, uh, doing experiments with cells that secrete some hormone. Uh, and uh, I believe it was histamine. Uh, and someone came and said, you know, the antibodies that you use to pour on those cells to trigger them, uh, to spew out uh, those antibodies, um, I can produce the same effect if I take the original antibodies and dilute them and dilute them and dilute them until <laughs> there's basically nothing left except water. It's so dilute that at least statistically speaking, there should be nothing left but water molecules. And, and Jacques Benveniste found it wasn't true. Uh, that he could uh, dilute and dilute. It was not an original observation. Someone came to his lab to show him, but 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 he said he said to this person, you know, oh, you know, go to the corner of my laboratory. It's a big lab, fifty people. Um, go do your thing, and pretty soon everybody was hovering around uh, the people doing the experiments because they couldn't believe that yeah. apparently water could retain the memory. Uh, of information from the molecules that had originally been there, but are not there anymore, apparently. Um, and so he published the paper and, um, or he tried to publish the paper. <laughs> he tried and, and he was laughed off by the uh, editor of Nature, uh, Sir John Maddox. And uh, Maddox said, uh, uh, this can't be right because if you're right, everybody else is wrong and therefore, <laughs> No way. Uh, and, uh, you know, being a guy with a backbone uh, who thought he was right because the evidence seemed to indicate it, uh, Jacques, who had been my, was my friend, um, uh, decided to uh, ask some of his colleagues to repeat the experiment um, uh, hmm. exactly the way he did it. It had to be repeated exactly. They did that. It was a group of, of people from different countries and they did it and they published, or they attempted to publish the paper jointly. They submitted it again to the same uh, editor in chief of Nature, Sir John Maddox. And the response was the same. Uh, I don't care how many people repeat it. Uh, by the way, what I'm telling you is all recorded and published in several oh, yeah. books. And yeah, uh, we're not gonna publish it because if you're, if you're right, everybody else is wrong. And I refuse to believe that everybody else is wrong. Therefore, we won't consider it. Well, um, pretty soon, Jacques, of course, didn't know what to do about that because he wanted it published in the most influential mainstream journal. He had the evidence, uh, evidence repeatable from different laboratories. And yet there was a refusal uh, mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to even, even consider publishing it. But pretty soon, Nature, which is situated, whose office is situated in London, uh, the studies originated in Paris, and you know the distance from Paris to London is not huge. Um, yeah, and, a few hours. And, and Paris is filled with homeopaths. And what what Ben Venice was demonstrating basically was the homeopathic technique. You could you could take something and dilute it, dilute it, dilute it, and still get the same the same effect. And the homeopaths were thinking, "My goodness, um, this famous scientist." is demonstrating uh, that there's something to it, to what yeah. we're doing and what seems to have 
clinical efficacy and uh, what's going on here? Why are you suppressing this information? You know, uh, it harks back to what seems to be existing today in our world, but that's a, a different issue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so, uh, so pretty soon, pretty soon um, there was a problem and Matt asked said to respond to the problem. And so uh, when I visited Jacques Benvenist, um, he told me, he said, oh, I got a call after all this stuff. I got a call from Maddox. He called on this phone right there. He pointed to the phone. He said, he called me. He said, I'll make a deal with you. Okay, what's the deal? He said, the deal is this. I will publish your paper next week in the next edition of, of, um, of Nature. Um, if you will agree, we will send a committee of peers to look over your shoulder, see what you're doing, and uh, you know we'll report back to our readers. So Ben Vanist being uh, being sure that he was right, um, you know, because they could repeat this experiment not every mm. time, but enough times easily to be statistically significant. Mm. Uh, we welcome uh, the committee of peers to come to look over our shoulder and report back, because you know, yeah, he, he knew that. Um, that he was right, um, uh, and and so many other so many other colleagues from multiple colleagues from different countries could repeat the experiment. What else could you ask for? Yeah. So they published the paper and uh, in Nature, and uh, there was a little disclaimer after it. it. Said we're not really sure about this stuff. A world, we're not sure, but we're going to send a group of peers over to look over their shoulders, see what they're doing, and report back to you in a month or so. So they went to Paris, our committee, a committee of peers. And the committee of peers consisted of uh, uh, the following. The first was the editor himself, who uh, was not a biologist. These were biological experiments. He was a physicist. And he actually never made it to his PhD, he dropped out, became a journalist, worked his way up gradually to become the editor of Nature. Uh, and the second one uh, was a guy from the National Institutes of Health. Uh, mm. and, and this guy, they had just put together an anti-fraud uh, group at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and this guy was, a, was part of that anti-fraud group. So if you, uh, Peter, you're a scientist and you know, you're, you're doing some experiments on rabbits and the rabbits uh, grew a, a black spot on the white um, of fur, uh, but you actually painted it on there. They're not real. Uh, and the university refused to, to acknowledge that you cheated. Uh, and one of your colleagues next door knew that you cheated, reported to the National Institutes of Health this guy would come or this guy would come to check you out and yeah. report back. See, so that uh, to protect everything that goes on at the National Institutes of Health. And I, oh, yeah. he was the second guy. And the third guy was, uh, his name was the amazing Randy. Uh, that's James oh. Randy, a magician. Yeah, the debunker. <laughs> the debunker, right, the debunker. So you can imagine with a, with a group like this, you can imagine uh, the committee they sent had something in mind. They were confident this must be some kind of fraud. Yeah. And, they, uh, and who better to send uh, the expert in fraud from the National Institutes of Health and the world's greatest magician who, who could figure out the tricks of all the other magicians. Widely acknowledged uh, to be really gifted at, at doing that. Um, so they came and they visited. And the first couple of experiments uh, uh, were done by the French um, technicians, and they got exactly the same result that they had reported. And the next one was done by the guy from NIH. He did the dilutions and the experiments and et cetera, et cetera. Turned out it didn't work uh, the way mm. they reported, even though they reported that it doesn't always work, but it works almost all the time. So they, uh, they huddled and they decided, well, it must be that since the French scientists, when they do it, uh, it, quote, works, unquote. And when the visitors come, the group of peers, if you will, it doesn't work. And so they decided it must be a trick, even though 
uh, the greatest magician who could debunk all the tricks of all the magicians couldn't find out what, what the trick was. They reported the sloppy recording and stuff like this. Mm. And that was basically the end of the Benvenist career because they published in Nature a report saying that all of this was a trick, a delusion, a trick. And, and, uh, and then Jacques ben Benvenist became, uh, became a, a, a scientific joke. You're having trouble remembering something? Why don't you drink some of that Benvenist water because it has water memory <laughs> associated with it. So he became a scientific joke and he died prematurely, even wow. though his, his work was outstanding. He had, he had wished to present something to the president of the National Academy of Science. And he had asked several of his colleagues who he regarded as reputable scientists, I was one of them, that they would be willing to act as monitors uh, to attest to the fact that during the experiments that he wanted to do, uh, that there was no cheating going on. And the results of the experiments were to have been evaluated by the president of the U.S. National Academy of Science, obviously a respectable person, but he died uh, just before wow. then. And so um, it was just after routine surgery. So I, I, I'm telling you this, hmm. this long, long story, but what I, what I meant, really wanted to indicate is, is um, it, he was, I guess, the first person who really seriously addressed the question of water memory, uh, because the water seemed to retain information. But since then, um, uh, there had been multiple groups uh, including people who repeated Ben Vinis experiment, published and got the same result. Uh, a group of Europeans from different laboratories wow. publishing as a consortium. Uh, and so there's not much question about it. And at our water conference, which I, we organize each year, this year it will be in Germany in October, it's the 15th annual. Ooh. And each time two or three people uh, come and report using each one using a different technique that water appears to have memory and, hmm. and the reason uh, i just I, i'm going on too long the, the reason the reason people can't understand um, how water could possibly have memory is they think of water as liquid water where the molecules are randomly oriented and they're bouncing around at a fierce number of times each second or each femtosecond even. So mm -hmm. how, how can the situ how how can how can that arrangement of molecules possibly store information? They have a point. However, the fourth phase of water is different. Uh, mm -hmm. The fourth phase of water is like a crystal. And mm -hmm. um, and crystals uh, store information. If you take computer memory, computer memory is basically a crystal, crystal of, of silicon and it contains uh, an array an ordered array of silicon atoms, and each atom, it turns out, uh, has two possible uh, states, an on, off, or zero, or one, or whatever. And that's how the information is stored in, in, in your thumb drive or essentially any computer memory. But easy water has pretty much the same characteristics. The oxygens and hydrogens are ordered, as I said, in this honeycomb kind of arrangement, they're ordered. And each oxygen atom um, can have not two states, but five different states, so-called mm. oxi uh, oxidation states. Yeah. Minus two is what we call valence. It's, um, it, it's the one we learn about in grade school, minus two. Yeah. But also you can find in any chemis chemistry textbook, minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two, five different states. So if you consider easy or fourth phase water, uh, same, just different nomenclature for, for the same substance. Uh, uh, it not only has the same or similar capacity as, as, as um, a standard computer memory, but enormously more capacity because when you think that each, each atom, at least in theory, can have five different states instead of two different states. Yeah. And you do the arithmetic, it turns out that the memory capacity or memory density is something like uh, 10 or 100 million, I can't remember the number, times the capacity 
of standard silicon memories if we could figure out how to get the information in and out. And that still is under, under consideration. So, um, so this is, this is big stuff. And yeah. uh, going back to the ancients, which is how you started the conversation, they knew that, um, that somehow information uh, could, could, be, um, uh, um, could be stored, could be um, uh, transmitted back and forth. And now we, we have scientists, even so-called mainstream scientists who are beginning to, to study this issue. Uh, one example, I'm not sure, I guess if we should call him a mainstream scientist, but Luc Montagnier, uh, he won a Nobel mm -hmm. Prize for discovering HIV, identifying it. Uh, he's doing this very actively, demonstrating water memory. For example, you put DNA mm -hmm. in water, uh, you dilute it, and you put that wa essentially water uh, next to another container of water. The two are sealed, no chemical information back and forth. And you take the water that's sitting next to the water that had contained the DNA. He says that there's information going back and forth. You take the informed water and use that water to create new DNA using the PCR method, the standard method. Yeah. And it creates new DNA it has the same sequence as the original DNA that was sitting next to it. Um, nothing short of amazing, you know. So, so the, the bottom line, um, I, I, I'm sorry I've taken so long to, to describe it. Well, you know, the idea of water memory at first when Jacques Benveniste was proposing it seemed utterly preposterous. Yeah. But now that we know that the water, especially water inside our body, also outside, that much of it is like crystalline uh, water, yeah. not ice, but not so different from ice in its structure, um, that that has uh, absolute capability of storing information. We don't know all details of how it works exactly, but in theory, it's there. And many experiments now show that water can store information. So I, I think we go full circle back to the ancients. They, they knew yeah. a lot of this. And I better yeah. shut my mouth now because I know you have <laughs> other, other questions. <laughs> no, I mean, it just goes into the sense of there's, there's an infinite amount of potential when we really look at the, I mean, honestly, it's almost like a technology of what water could be introduced to as in terms of just like battery storage. I know just the, the operation of using water and photovoltaic cells and even just what you're talking about in terms of memory storage. Like there's, I dare, I don't, I don't like to say this term too often, but it's almost like, you know, because everyone always likes to just think of consciousness, of, you know, and there's this whole debacle of how you want to talk about that, how it's spread out and understood throughout the animal kingdom. But it comes back to this understanding of atomical and molecular consciousness is that every atom truly does have its own consciousness to an extent. And that's kind of the next avenue I want to really dive into with you is that, you know, the late um, Masaru Emoto he was really one of the first kind of, and he wasn't even really a scientist from my understanding is, but he was one of the first really um, philosophers, spiritualists, just kind of inquisitive, curious minds that was doing these large scale experiments of just talking to water and just like the intentions that you put behind your words to water itself. And when you talk about the fact that it can contain DNA information, I like the term informed water. I love it. Uh, yeah. The fact that water actually has this ability and it demonstrates memory. Do you see us having a role in consciousness and, you know, beings of life that we have a role in how we actually interact with water? Can we tap into this consciousness of the water and get information from it? And get information. Well, yeah. Potentially. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, yeah, I mean, this, this, could have a, this could have a real impact uh, in health. Um, um, for example, uh, um, you know, if, if, um, if, if the water has a kind of consciousness, if you will, I, um, that, that's one, one word to, to, uh, to, to use, and uh, a lot of people use it. Uh, 
I, I, I guess I tend to use it myself sometimes, uh, for lack of a better word, but it's still a bit vague to, yeah. uh, to be able to define that. And, and the vagueness is, is one of the terms that puts off uh, mainstream scientists who like to have something more concrete that they could you know, sink their teeth into, if you like to sink your teeth into concrete. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but, but anyway, it, it's used. And so um, y- you can think about, um, um, about healing. So um, in, in, mm. in several different ways, um, you know, the, 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 let me just go back a step and saying that the water, as we started this conversation, the water is critical to function. And if your cell, if your cell doesn't have uh, enough water, um, since water plays a role in pretty much everything the cell does, you got to have a full complement of that kind of water uh, in your body. And uh, you being a healthy guy, I can tell uh, just by looking and by the fact that you keep drinking water. I assume it's not vodka. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> and uh, I, I get reminded myself that I should uh, give up on, on my coffee and switch to completely to water. Uh, but uh, anyway, you're going you're gonna to have that water in your cells, and there are various ways to build that water to, uh, to increase or restore function. Okay, that's one. But, but the, the easier fourth phase water is a, a generic uh, kind of a structure to it. And I'm not mm-hmm. suggesting that every water in every cell is exactly the same. The evidence that we have so far is that the water in each cell is some kind of modification of, of that water, a variant of that water. For example, hmm. uh, the easy water might have more charge or less charge or a different distribution of these charges. And, and, and that the certain distribution of these charges will be characteristic of one cell, like a muscle cell would have one distribution of those charges and a nerve cell might have a, another. And so uh, if, if the cell has become pathological in some way and it's not operating, w- one way of restoring that function is not only to create more easy water, but to make sure it's got the right information or the right charges, the right charge mm. distribution. And that's basically information. And if you can impart yeah. that information from outside, see, that's a kind of therapy without pharmaceuticals. But uh, for example, it, it's possible since the water has uh, information storage capacity, you can imagine it imparting, uh, uh, for example, um, information to water information like antibody information uh, against, um, uh, for example, against COVID. Uh, suppose, suppose you could get it that way. You could, you could get it by imparting antibody information to your body. You get the antibodies uh, not, not necessarily uh, through uh, a, a kind of standard vaccine or even the non-standard vaccines that are being administered, but basically through water. You mm. impart the information to the water and the water has the information, the antibodies that act against the, uh, the COVID. Uh, yeah. I mean, it follows that sort of idea um, yeah. can follow uh, rather, rather directly. Um, uh, I mean, as as one example of of a kind of healing that can arise out of out of this the, these kinds of mechanisms. So, so yeah. that, that's how how the idea of uh, shall we say consciousness uh, uh, can do it, and and I guess healing uh, in general. Healing uh, fits right into that because the healers are doing pretty much that. And I, I guess that's what yeah. Emoto uh, had, had been doing and uh, applying a kind of consciousness to the water, whether, yeah. whether the consciousness was through his thinking or, or through other methods. Through, um, er, early on, he was using sound, music uh, uh, to do this. I, I remember, uh, you know, John Lennon, um, produced beautiful crystals when the water had been exposed to John Lennon and, and then frozen. Most scientists don't take this seriously because um, um, uh, first of all, it seems like nonsense at the outset uh, to mainstream scientists who 
don't think in terms of consciousness and such. And yeah. second, because um, Emoto, unfortunately, and um, I know those people very well, the people who have taken over since the passing of, um, uh, of Emoto. And one, of the, one of the reasons why scientists, many scientists, most scientists didn't take his work seriously is that uh, his results were not obtained using the scientific method. That is, yeah. you know, he, he would impart his information and he'd freeze 50 different samples of that information. And he had a tendency to pick the one that illustrated what he wished to illustrate most beautifully. He said, here, look at this. Uh, and that's not, mm. that's not a, a scientific way of doing it. Uh, and, you know, so I, I've been um, working with some of the people at the Emoto office in Tokyo and trying to, to get them to, to do the same kinds of experiments, but to use methods that are perhaps would be considered more scientific by the scientific yeah. community. Because I think it would be to everybody's advantage uh, for them to look more closely at, at this work and evaluate it. Many groups are now um, springing up around the world doing experiments very similar to what Emoto is doing and with equally interesting results. Cool. So yeah, I think this is coming now. This is the future. Um, oh, uh, yeah. It's going to take a while, I, I think, but um, I think for open-minded people who are willing to look at the evidence, and by evidence, I don't necessarily mean Emoto evidence, but I mean evidence collected by scientists, some of them rather distinguished scientists, um, doing experiments that uh, uh, abide by standard scientific methods, mm -hmm. have come to the conclusion that there really is memory of water. Very important. Ooh. Well, and that just gets into the concept too, where there's so many properties of this easy water that really haven't been fully explored. Is there any last words you'd like to kind of inspire our listeners with? Uh, well, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's the search for truth. Um, mm. um, it's, um, truth is beautiful uh, and the truth is simple. Uh, at least uh, my, own, my own vision uh, of the search for truth is no different from, uh, from Sir William of Ockham, who's responsible for the so-called Ockham's razor. You know, you have two separate ideas. Uh, to explain something, and the simpler one is more likely to be uh, the one that is, is ground truth. And he was, mm. he was dealing with the question of the existence of God. God exists or God doesn't exist. And a few centuries later, took, Newton uh, took up his idea and applied it to science. And uh, he said, when you have two scientific competing ideas, the simpler one is the one that's likely to prevail. And that persisted for many years uh, until maybe a hundred years ago where matters began to get more abstract and complex. Uh, my own view is that uh, Newton was right and that Sir William Ockham was right and that nature is simple. And, and I guess my, my message to anybody who cares to listen is when you read the textbook, uh, if the idea seems simple and beautiful good chance that it's, it, it's on its way toward truth. If it looks complicated and uh, twists, many twists and turns and assumptions and whatever, good chance that um, it's wrong and it's better to start from a new foundation and build from there. And that new foundation is more likely to lead to scientific truth. And I know that uh, many scientists um, will ob object uh, and, and claim, oh, you're throwing out all the history of science and such, but <laughs> I guess after doing science for half a century, you're entitled to an opinion. And that's what I would like to convey, uh, a, sense, a sense that science is ultimately simple and um, in truth lies simplicity. And um, I think if many of us um, look for those simple truths, we'll find them. So, I love it. I love it. And with that, folks, thanks for tapping in. I'm going to have you hold on for the after show, Gerald. But roll the outro. And that concludes this episode of Creatives Chat. Thank you for watching. 
Join us every Thursday at 3.33 p.m. Pacific Daily Time as creative minds get together and chat about who knows what. View more episodes on our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks again to our sponsors for making this show possible. Thank you, We Are Storically, for your conscious human apparel. Shop online at wearehistorically.com. Hi, I'm Darius Wilrich. I'll teach you everything you need to know about playing jazz piano like a pro with my 12-week online video course and downloadable guidebook, Jazz Piano Pro Essentials. Enroll today at jazzpianopro.com. Thank you for joining us. Have a happy always.